Come on, church. If that must be, no matter how the world may seem, die out in me. Hallelujah. Grab your Bibles since we're here at this point to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1 and 1 verse, verse 18. And then we will go to the book of Psalms 51 and 1 verse. And that is verse 7. Amen. It's our tradition in the house of the Lord. Amen. When we read the Bible that everybody stands. Amen. A great tradition in honoring of the Lord. Look at somebody right now and tell them in a time like this when hell is set loose say the kingdom of God still stands look at somebody else and tell them in a time like this when hell is set loose say the kingdom of God still stands do you believe the kingdom of God still stands do you believe the kingdom of God still stands yes you do the kingdom of God still stands Isaiah chapter 1 and the 18 verse and then we'll jump over to Psalms 1 and seven come now isaiah says that the lord told him to say come now and let us reason together saith the lord though your sins be as scarlet they shall be as white as snow though they are red like crimson they shall be like and or as wool psalms 51 and verse 7 says purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Somebody shout hallelujah. And since we're here all by ourselves and nobody can tell us that we can't read Psalms 51 and 7 together. Let's read it all together. Read, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. I want to speak to us on the subject this morning though your sins be as scarlet and my subtopic is Jesus can clean you up come on look at somebody and said Jesus can clean you up don't be shy to look at somebody and tell them that Jesus can clean you up father we thank you we bless your name we glorify you father we give you praise it is a day that you have made in it we shall rejoice and be exceedingly glad lord it is not our day it's your day you made it and you placed us in it and you gave us the breath of life the ruah the spirit that we may live and and have life touch us today anoint us lord god from every walks of life and we're here before you lord jesus asking you for a word not a word from henry henry can't save us but we need a word from the lord have your way today teach us thy way O oh lord and lead us down the plain path for your righteousness we honor you we glorify you and we give you all the glory and praise somebody who is ready for a word from the lord this morning open your mouth and put your head back and said in jesus name amen you may be seated in the presence of the lord amen grace mercy and peace again from the lord and savior jesus christ i'm super happy to be home again amen anybody happy to see me today amen not everybody but amen thank god for being away we were at an amazing conference in uh, an amazing conference as a matter of fact i'm getting uh, send messages from pastor mcdonald who is awesome loved our conference anybody love if you love agc 2024 put your hands together and say thank god it was a blessing to our lives amen and thank god for being windsor and that was a blessing as well amen i'm home today but on my way home the lord spoke to me that, that today would be a day that he would like to speak to us on the subject though your sins be as scarlet and the problem the problem is and the situation is a lot of people see themselves as sinners that cannot be saved but i came to rebuke that today somebody said we're going to rebuke it today you need to work with me today say we're going to rebuke it today 
And for our visitors who have not used, maybe not used to the apostolic way, we get a bit charismatic. I'm very charismatic. Amen. So get ready to wave your hand and tell God thank you. Amen. Don't be shy to jump in and say, Lord, I thank you for your deliverance. Though your sins be as scarlet. And my subtopic that the Lord told me to tell somebody, Jesus can clean you up. Anybody believe that Jesus can clean you up? Anybody believe that Jesus can clean you up? Amen. We're not afraid of the devil. Jesus can clean you up. I'll start this afternoon by, by saying that the concept of sin occupies a significant and often troubling place in the human experience. It represents more than just moral failing. But it also embodies a deep-seated sense of guilt. When we sin, there's a deep-seated sense of guilt and regret that can weigh heavily on an individual's conscience and or psyche. When you are marred in sin, sin is not your friend. Sin leaves a mark. When you're in sin, it, it brings guilt guilt heavy guilt it brings regrets heavy regrets i wish i could never did that i how many times have you and i said that if i knew better i would not do it why because sin will always cause you to be in regret and it weighs heavily on the individual's conscience and the psyche as aforementioned this troubling burden of sin can subsequently lead to feelings of despair feelings of isolation creating a rift not only between individuals and their own sense of self-worth, but, but also between them and the great God, the higher power, amen, who we call God and we believe is God. Sin has a way of creating trouble within ourselves. When, when sin leaves us in despair and in isolation and we have regrets and guilt, everything that's weighing on us, we, we get to a place where we feel discombobulated. We, we feel a, a sense that, that, that all the trouble that I've gone through, all because of sin hates. The devil hates us and sin did not come to make friendship with you. Sin has come to destroy you. And so it creates within ourselves because we were sinners and have done some things that we regret. We feel disgusted within ourselves. We feel as if we're not worth it. A lot of times we, I meet people and the first thing they said, I, I, if I go to church, the church will burn down. Or if I walk into the building, something dramatic. Because of how they see themselves. And that's what sin does to you. Sin causes you to see yourself as the worst kind of creation. But I come to tell you that the devil is a liar. Sin also causes you to have rift between you and heaven. Sin tells you because you're so marked that God left you and did not help you. In so much that you start saying, where is God when the trouble comes? Where is God in my trial? Where is God in my situation? Sin not only creates within you a rift, but it creates a rift between you and heaven. So then, and I could ask the question, but I would leave you there. How many times have we, and I ask it rhetorically, I'd say, how many times have we blamed God for our mistakes? How many times have we accused God for being the thing that we actually did? We have accused him for many things, but, but, but I come to tell you that that's what sin does. The goal of sin is not to make you happy. The goal of sin is to completely destroy your life. Notwithstanding, amidst this or these emotional and spiritual turmoil, there miraculously exists a glimmer of hope. How many believe that there's a hope out of sin? As, as illustrated by the words of the prophet Isaiah, his message reminds us that despite the gravity of our sin, despite the feelings of despair, uh, despite how we feel that God has left us and we feel all by ourselves, symbolically represented uh, as being what we'll deal with today, that word scarlet. When, when you hear that word scarlet, we work on it. Scarlet is, is this red bloody thing. It, that's a symbol, a color associated with deep stain and imperfection. I want you to know today that there, there is still an opportunity offered for transformation and renewal. Even though your life may be stained, there is still hope. Even though your trouble might be great, there's still hope. I wish I had somebody. 
Even though that you feel like everything all around you is destroyed, there is still hope. Somebody said, there's hope, there's hope. There's still an opportunity. There's still hope for renewal. Your life is not completely discarded. Your life has value. How many know that your life has value? Come on, open your mouth and say, my life has value. This, this, this promise then, family, is that one sin can be made as white as snow. Though your sin, which is the scarlet we're going to deal with, though your sin may be a scarlet, red, bloody, destructive, somewhere there's hope that God can turn it around in your favor. There's hope that your sins can be made as white as snow, which speaks to the power of the Lord's divine grace and forgiveness. How many know that the Lord wants to forgive us? How many know that though you have done great atrocity, God wants to forgive you? Oh, you don't even believe it, but I'll make you believe it today. Lift up your hand right now and say, though my sins be as scarlet, there's a promise that God wants to make it white as snow. Come on, say the promise is mine. If you don't believe it, that's fine. But if you believe it, say amen. The promise is yours. Though your sins may seem to be a bloody mess. There is a promise that he can make that bloody mess as white as snow. I wish I had. The psalmist said, the psalmist 103, Psalms 103 and, and 8 to 12, he says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious. Hear this. Slow to anger. Abounding in love. He will not allow, not, he will not always accuse. That is profound because people are always trying to accuse he will not always accuse nor will he harbor his anger forever he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquity this is powerful what it's saying is that god is saying i'll give you deliverance and you give me your sins i'll give you help and i'll take away your burden i'll give you hope and i'll take away your sadness and your sorrow i'll give you life eternal and i'll take away debt from you somebody said god is a merciful god he's merciful he's compassionate and he is gracious in the churches we we preach a lot of the judgment of god but i come by to tell somebody today that you can't always preach the judgment of the lord you got to remind the people that god is still a loving and, and a gracious and a merciful god I know God is also a consuming fire, but before all that, he's the God of love. Tell somebody he's the God of love. I wish somebody believed that he's the God of love. Say, so my God is the God of love. You have not heard this charismatic preaching, just jump in and wave your hand and say, I'll take the love. <laughs> Anybody want God to love you today? Anybody want God to love you today? Shout, the love of God, the love of God, the love of... I dare to tell you something. You think it might be charismatic, but if you lift those antennas to God. When we were younger in the 70s, I'm 40, 54 this year. But when we were younger in the 70s in Jamaica, we had to put antennas on the TV. And somebody would go out and move the antenna. Can't see the channel. Anybody from that era? We had to move the antenna around so that you could get the channel. It said, turn it to the left. Turn it to the left. Turn it sideways. And that's what we did to get the channel that we need. If you raise your hand today, your hand will become the antenna for the glory of God to come down in your life. Somebody raise those hands and wave it right now and say, Lord, I need your forgiveness. Say, Lord, I need your love. Lamentation 2, 22 and 23 says something powerful. It says, it says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassion never fails. They are, re they are new every morning great is your faithfulness that means every day you wake up there's a new blessing we used to sing a song when i came up we don't deserve it but yet we are blessed every day that you wake up is a day to tell god thank you every day i wake up and i'm in my right mind i say lord thank you lamentation jeremiah call it new mercy you don't have to ask you're alive today you're here for the dedication this is not your doing it's not because we ran or did sit-ups or ate well it's because of god's mercies 
Why are we in the land of the living? We don't even know how the whole thing is created. Lord, I wish. How is it created? How is it sustained? Tell somebody it's the Lord's mercies. And Jeremiah said it's because of the Lord's great love that we are not consumed. Watch this. I love this part. His compassion never fails. This is important. That means I lose compassion at time when you get on my nerves. But God, I thank God that he's not like Andrew Henry. I thank that he's all by himself. When I am on his nerves, he still extends compassion towards me. That's why we love him. And we sing the song, I love him because he what? First loved me. And purchased my salvation on Calvary. I love him because his compassion has never failed. I deserve to be cast aside and cast into hell. But his compassion, his compassion, say never fails. His compassion never fails. You know, I'm reminded, I'm reminded in the midst of the sermon, the Lord dropped it in my heart. It was late last night. I'm reminded of the story of the God in the gospel of, of, of John 8, 1 to 11. When the teachers of the religions and the law, the religious law, and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. Caught in the act. That means they saw her. Or one of them were a part of it. Wish I had. The Bible said that they placed her in front of the crowd. We often preach it was in front of Jesus, but they placed her in front of a massive crowd who came to hear Jesus' teaching. This is, this is powerful. Teacher, they said to Jesus. This woman was caught in the act of adultery, in the very act. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? Now, we have a great example in Jesus. Somebody said we have a great example. But, but I want you to hear the Lord's slowness of anger. Can I help you today? I want you to hear how this woman was caught by the law, by the by, by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers. They were caught by the religious leaders, the one who have authority. And they said, the law of Moses said she should die. What about, hold up, wait a minute. I asked my sister, where's the man? If she should die, shouldn't he die too? But I'll leave that for another day. She should die. Huh? What do you say, Jesus? Trying to accuse him to see if he's a, who kind of man? But, but, but I wanted to hear how slow of anger he is. He says, let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Now, I don't care how scholarly you are. Nobody could have come up with that solution. Everybody would have said, well, let me think about it. No. He said, immediately, if you have not sinned, and don't you know that there's not a person who has not sinned? There's not a person who have not sinned in the last hour. I'm come to check you at the point. There's not a person who have not sinned in the last half an hour. I could get down to a few minutes, but I'll leave you right there. Huh? There's not a person who have not sinned. Everybody, the Bible said, all have sinned and fallen short of what? The glory of God. None of us are like Jesus. There's not even one of us that's like Jesus. So Jesus says, if you have not sinned, pick up the stone and hit her. I dare you. I dare you to hit her. If you're a perfect hitter. So the story goes that they all got up one by one and walked away from the youngest. Or from the oldest to the youngest. They all left. But if that were the story, it would be great. But, but I want you to listen to Compassion. Somebody say compassion. The same thing that Jeremiah says. Jesus lived it. He put it in action. It's one thing to say it and another thing to live it. It's one thing to preach the gospel and another thing to live the gospel. It's one thing to say I love you and another thing to show you love. It's one thing to say I'm merciful and another thing to show you mercy. I wish I had help today. Jesus when he was by himself with her. She laid there as if she deserved the condemnation because she did. But Jesus says to her, neither do I condemn thee. Hold on. Stop. Did you hear what he said? 
Did, yeah, okay. He said, neither do I. But they all condemned her. What's the neither for? Neither means it's conjoined. It says, like them, I don't condemn you. And I won't stone you. But that sounds paradoxical because they condemned her. Powerful, isn't it? It's powerful because the mere fact that he got them to walk away showed compassion. You'll get it later on when you get home. <laughs> it's so powerful you can't even get it in your mind. He said, neither do I condemn them. This is revelation. Tell somebody this is revelation. Jesus used their walking away as forgiveness. <laughs> he used their walking away and he said as they did not stone you I will not stone you either go and sin no more I come by to tell somebody that your sin may be a scholar but I come to tell the Lord told me to tell you go and sin no more you didn't come here to be condemned you came here to get deliverance you came here to be healed you came here to be set free mercy is ready to be poured upon your life walk go away sin no more Somebody help me say sin no more. The Lord put this in my mind. He said forgiveness is birthed out of compassion. Forgiveness is birthed out of compassion. You cannot forgive unless you're compassionate. You cannot forgive unless you are compassionate. Not only compassionate for the person, but compassionate, period. If you don't have compassion, you don't have the power of the Lord. Now, this transformation then signifies a movement from the recipient, a shift, if you will, from a state of darkness. When mercy comes upon you, it moves you from a state of darkness, characterized by shame and alienation, and it moves you from darkness to the light. God wants to move you from darkness to light. God wants to take you out of darkness and put you in the marvelous light. His compassion is to get you out of trials and put you into freedom. Take you out of chains and give you a praise. That's why the man of God said, I'll praise the Lord at. I'll praise the Lord at. His praise shall continually be in my He wants to move you out of shame and alienation, alienation and darkness and place you in a marvelous light representing purity, acceptance, and reconciliation. God wants to reconcile each and every one of us. I don't know how you feel today, but I came out to tell you that, that God wants to reconcile. He wants to reconcile everybody. He, has, he wished that none would perish. But that everybody come to this great reconciliation of God. Somebody shout, I want to be reconciled. Hear me, church. The prophet Isaiah, his words encapsulate a profound doctrinal truth. That is, no matter how heavy our burdens may feel or seem, there exists a pathway towards redemption. No matter how heavy it is, there's a way out. Just tap your neighbor gently. Don't hit nobody. And tell them, hey neighbor, there's a way out. Come on, tell somebody there's a way out. The Lord told me to tell you that this morning. My hand is stretched out still. Come on, tell that neighbor again. God's hand of mercy is ready to embrace you. Say God's hand of mercy is ready to embrace you. Lord, this is such a what a salvation message today. Look at y'all and saying none. God's hand is ready to embrace you. God's hand is ready to pull you out. God's hand is Lord. I wish I can't scare the visitors, but but God's hands are ready to pull you out. His hands are stretched out still. You're down in the mire, but his hands are stretched out still. You're down in the pit, but his hands are stretched out still. You deserve to die, but his hands are stretched out still. mercy so great what return can i make for mercy so what constant and sure he's trying to pull you out somebody hook up your hand and say lord pull me out 
this, this notion or offer from God not only provides comfort, but it also encourages individuals from, from every walk of life and vices of life. Because people come from all walks of life with all kinds of vices in their life. It encourages us to seek forgiveness and to embrace the possibility of a new beginning. Everybody needs a new beginning. Lord, boy, I wish I had. Even if you've been walking with God, there's some time when you get to a place where I said, I just need a restart. I, anybody wants a new beginning from heaven? I just want to get to a place of new beginning. I want to get to a place, we call it the born again experience. I want to be born again. I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost again. I want to be renewed again. I want to be lifted up again. I want a new start again. Anybody want to renew? I'll lift up your hand and say, Lord, bring the antenna. Get the antenna. But say, Lord, renew my life. This offer emphasized the importance of, of a restored resilience and hope in the human spirit. Human, us human beings need God. We need God. We need a restoration. We need, all we hear is violence every day. Murders and the plot to murder. Wars, rumors of war. We need a touch from heaven. I need hope. Somebody, I need hope. I need a hope. I, and I pray that mankind will get that hope. And when we meet God, he offers uh, the offer, an important offer to restore. Give us again that hope in, in our spirit. Uh, particularly through the faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, as we overcome our despairs, we need a touch from God. I, I don't know about anybody else, but I need a touch. I might be walking with God, but every now and then I need another touch. Uh, you might not have started walking with the Lord yet, but said, Lord, I need a touch. Lord, if you just hold my hand, like we did the dedication of the children today, Lord, we need God to hold our hand and lead us. Lead me, Savior, lest I stray. Gently lead me. Where are you leading me? I'm leading you to a new beginning. I'm leading you to a restoration. I'm leading you to the point where you can drink of this, this cup of God and drink and you'll thirst no more. He's offering it to all of humanity. The psalmist alluded to in Psalms 40 and 2. He says, lift me up out of the slimy pit. That's what David said in the Psalms 40 and 2. He said, lift me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. David is saying this. That I, David, was in a mire. I needed a new beginning. And David knew God. But as he's walking with God, sometimes you slip and you fall. And you fall down into mirous places, muddy places deep pits i wish i had help and when you're down in the deep pit, somebody's ready to condemn you look at it remember job's friend they condemning me he did this he did that the people are always trying to condemn you oh you ain't good you ain't right something's wrong with you your face look like a moon that's mine your face round like the moon yeah they always have something negative to say about me oh you did this when you were 12 you did that when you're 14 and they can and everybody has always have some, but david fell down in the hole but david says that when God brought him out, he had a testimony. He said, he brought me up also out of a harbor pit. Out of a miry, muddy clay. And set my feet upon a rock. And establish my going. God is ready to do it also for you. Somebody said, do it for me, Lord. Do it for me, Lord. Listen, I come about to tell anybody in this house, don't worry about what the neighbor is doing or saying. You lift up your hand if you need help. If you need help from Jesus, today is your day of salvation. And my mama might like it, my sister may like it, my husband ain't like it, my wife, I need God. I lift up my hand and say, Lord, I need your help. Get that, turn the antenna to the left. Turn the antenna. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody who needs God, raise your antenna and say, Lord, I need your help.
I mentioned scarlet. I mentioned scarlet. Now let me deal with the term scarlet. Now, I'll deal with it as a pair in, in Bible. So this term serves as a powerful and evocative, if you will, symbol that resonates deeply with the theme of sin. Not only sin, but also of human frailty. This vivid descriptor, Scarlet, brings red in, it is a bright red in manner. Scarlet is a bright red in manner. Carries connotations that extend far beyond mere color. It's contextual reciprocals weighs heavy on human transgression. Not only that, but it also weighs heavy on the emotional turmoil associated with it. That, that means when you're talking about scarlet, it's depicting this big red manner of being. Transgressions. We're talking about the worst. Emotional turmoil. Now, in biblical language, scarlet is often linked to blood. A potent symbol of, watch this, death. We know blood, but nobody wants to see blood flow. As a matter of fact, some of us, when we get a cut, we see the blood, we pass out. <laughs> or if you see blood somewhere, you pass out. This, this blood, this red, scarlet, represents death. And thus evoke feelings of guilt and defeat and the consequences of sin. So whenever scarlet was mentioned in Bible in the ancient world, and we don't live there, but, but it still have the depiction and the connotation today. When that was mentioned, when you see blood, you see death comes forth. Defeat comes forth. Guilt and the consequences of sin come forth. Scarlet had that depiction. Now, the Hebrew word for scarlet is the word shani, as H-A-N-I, shani, a word that that derived from a root that means to be overlaid in red. That's what it means. To be poured over, to be overlaid in red. So when the Hebrew said Shani or that, that word scarlet, they said you're overlaid with red, highlighting the intense and glaring nature of sin. So when the Hebrew talked to you about scarlet, it was saying that it's not only red, but you, the person they're dealing with, are such a sinner that in their eyes, you're overlaid with red, blood, death, guilt, consequences of sin when they looked at you. This choice of imagery is significant as it suggests that, that sin is not something easily overlooked or dismissed. So when they called you a sinner, when the Hebrews called you a sinner, what they're saying to you is that in our eyes, you are overlaid with red and you look like you. You are the consequences of sin. You look like a guilty person. You look like somebody who deserved to be cast away, put out of our community. That connotation had a heavy bearing. That connotation was said heavy. And that's how when they, the scribes and the Pharisees were calling Jesus that you're the son of Beelzebub. What they're saying about Jesus is that you are like scarlet. You are doused in red. You are a sinner. But instead, it is an indelible mark on the soul. A stain that can be both conspicuous and burdensome. So when you had that, when somebody said you're like red, your sin is like scarlet, it's a burden that they laid on you. So when people call people sinner, you're putting a burden on them. Be careful how you address the people of God. And I'm talking about all human beings. You're quick to point, but you are a sinner. When you call people a sinner, you are putting a burden upon their head. You're saying that you are not worth salvation. I'll tell somebody you got to be careful. Now, now, rabbinic scholars have often reflected on this sim symbolism, noting that the brightness of scarlet represents the stark contrast between human imperfection and divine holiness. They're saying that when you are marred, you are so separated from God. 
When you have our sins are like scarlet, God is way up there and you are way down here. I, I need to tell you this because you need to understand as a people the, the meaning of words. When, when somebody call you a sinner, you're, they're saying to you, you are so deep down in the mire and God is so far. You are so far removed from God. That's why we have to be careful. Tell somebody you got to be careful. So, so then in rabbinic thought, the, the use of scarlet also invites contemplation of the nature of repentance and forgiveness. So the thought is that in your state, you need to repent. You need forgiveness. Just as scarlet can symbolize the gravity of sin, it also underscored the the transformative power of God's grace. So what God did was he looked at that and he says, listen, you may call them separated and you may call them hellions and you may call them not worthy, but when I see them, I see opportunity for salvation. <laughs> Boy, I wish I had help in this place. When man sees you, man call you a sinner. When man looks at your faults and failure, they say you have no hope. But when God sees you, God said, there is a chance. Come on, tell somebody there's yet hope. There's yet hope. When God sees you, God said, there's hope. I, I can renew Susie. I can renew Patsy. I can redeem John. God said, when I see the blood, when I look at you, I see a possibility. I know what the world says and I know what rabbinic thought says, but what is Jesus saying? Jesus said, there is hope. Somebody said, there's hope yet for me. Come on, said, there's yet hope for me. When he sees you now, though your sins are red like scarlet, the Lord says, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to turn it around in your favor. Come on, somebody look up and say, Lord, I'm highly favored before God. When he sees you, he says, I can save somebody. When he sees you, he said, I could pull that one out of the mire. When, I, when he sees you, he says, that one thinks that there's no hope left for me. The devil is a liar. There's hope for you. When he see, Man says you're filthy, but God says you're redeemable. Man said you should be cast away, but God said I still love you. Anybody know that God still loves you? Come on, help me. But if you want the help from God, you're going to have to open up your mouth and say, Lord, help me. Like some of you ain't helping me preach, but it's all right. I remember you. I come to God and I tell God, help me anyhow. That's what David did in Psalms 51 and 7. You got to understand what he did. David cried to God. He cried out, emblemic of the need to be cleansed of his scarlet. David said, purge me. I'm filled with blood, but purge me. I'm filled with blood, but purge me. He said, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be made as white as snow. I don't know what you want or what you came for, but I came to get a cleanup from God. I don't know what your intentions are, but I came today to get help from God. I came today to get my delay. I got a close, but I came today to get help from God. Somebody lift up your hand and said, I came for my deliverance. Come on, say, I came for my help. Come on, help me, somebody. Somebody said, I came for help. I walked into this house today. I walked in with a heavy burden. I walked in with the heavy trials of my head. But I'm not leaving here until I get my deliverance. Somebody said, clean me up, Lord. Open your mouth and say, Lord, clean me up. I would end there, but I got to say something about God. Now, the biblical implication of our text is, this afternoon is, is profound. It is profound as it reveals God's character. I'm not talking about your character. We all talk about our character, but I'm talking about God's character. Somebody say God's character. It's not only a character that is just and righteous, but God's character is also a character of mercy how many know that god is a merciful god help me somebody say god is a merciful god now while sins incur judgment god can 
continues to extend his grace and the writer said grace grace god's grace grace that will pardon our sins i don't know what you came for but i come to tell you that the character of god is beyond our understanding the character of god is so great the character of god is so amazing that while he's a righteous god he's still a merciful god some of you need his mercy right now why don't you open up your mouth and say lord i need your mercy somebody say i need god's touch i need god's help i know god is a righteous god but in my fallen state he reached down his hand for me while i was sinking looking to rise no more the master of the sea and the ocean reached down his hand for me and he delivered me from all my sins that's why i can come in the house of god today i can bless the children and i can bless your life because god has been merciful to me and i can praise him anybody got a praise for god's mercy anybody got a praise for god's mercy shout the merciful grace of god has laid down upon me some of you are acting weird before the visitors you better open up your mouth and shout hallelujah thank god for saving me let the visitors know that your god is a merciful god he's not only a consuming fire but god is a god of mercy somebody shout mercy somebody shout mercy somebody shout mercy david said i was going down I was deep down in the mire I was cast aside I didn't deserve any of God's love but he said Lord if you just wash me Lord if you use his up Lord if you just cleanse me Lord if you just rub it on me I know I look like scarlet I know I look red I know I look like sin I know I look like I should be separated from God I know I look like nothing worthy to be salvaged but you reach down your hands for me some of you didn't get it yet the blood of Jesus against you uh, people are here to get delivered and you're sitting down open up your mouth children of God and said if you were not for God's mercy I would have been consumed but his compassion failing not his mercies I renew every morning somebody said great is God's faithfulness so he washed me he cleansed me and then I look for, I transform from bloody to white as snow dirty to white as snow rejected to the accepted hated to the love cast aside to the beloved hopeless to the hopeful sad to the joyful broke to the rich empty to the full unhappy to the happy somebody say lord thank you somebody give god praise and say lord i thank you for your mercy hallelujah i came home with this word from the lord that i'm gonna wash you and make you white as snow though your sins be as scarlet i'm gonna make you clean somebody shout one more time thank you jesus I'm done. I'll close with this. Though your sins be as scarlet. Somebody said, though your sins be as scarlet. Come on, open your mouth and say, though your sins be as scarlet. Say, Jesus can clean you up. 